A heads up that the following episode contains images of death from warfare, specifically the American Civil War. There are bodies, there are corpses, so viewer discretion is advised. It was February of 1862, one year after 11 southern states had seceded from the Union and the Civil War had begun. Battles were raging across Virginia and the Carolinas to Missouri and Oklahoma. Just a few months later, the Battle of Shiloh in Tennessee would leave 24,000 Union and Confederate soldiers dead. But our story takes place far away from the carnage, in the Shaker village of Mount Lebanon, New York, where a 25-year-old Shaker woman, Sister Cecilia DeVere, was fast asleep. Sister Cecilia had been born in Ireland, and as a child, her father, Thomas de Vere, might have tried to raise a guerrilla army in Northern England. Thomas was a member of an English political movement called the Chartists, who fought for universal male suffrage, often peacefully, but sometimes not. When Cecilia was about four years old, her family fled to America, where Thomas became a radical journalist, and Cecilia eventually found her way to Mount Lebanon. Sometime during that cold, quiet night, as Sister Cecilia slept, she began to sing a song that no one had ever heard before. According to another Shaker sister, who probably got woken up by all that singing, Cecilia sang the song three times over, a song we now know as Supplication in a Nation's Calamity, or Prayer for the Captive. The Shakers would have called it a gift song, a song brought about by heavenly inspiration. It quickly spread through the Shaker community, and it's said that in 1865, Shaker villages from Kentucky to Maine sang supplication in a nation's calamity to honor President Lincoln after he was assassinated. Today we're going to listen to this song and use it to talk about the Civil War, slavery, COVID, Shaker values, and how Sister Cecilia was kind of an amazing prophet, or prophetess, prophetess. Anyway, it's a, it's a good word. Here's our song. Dark is the cloud that rests over the nation. Wild is the war cry that pierces the air. God's heavy judgment spread wide desolation. Strong hearts are bound in the depths of despair. Lord, may the bands of the captive be broken. Oh, may this struggle bring true liberty. Teach men Welcome back. A quick ethnomusicology note. You heard me harmonizing to the song just now. I made up that harmony because I felt compelled to, but I don't know if the Shakers have ever harmonized to supplication in a nation's calamity. Harmony has been a part of Shaker song traditions since the late 19th century, but I've never seen a version of supplication written out with harmony parts. Having said that, if you want to learn the song line by line, as well as its harmony, 
check out the companion video linked in the notes below. Okay, so to understand this song, first we need to know a few things about the Shakers. You might be thinking, uh, yeah, who are the Shakers again? Are they the same as the Quakers? Don't they make nice furniture? Are they the ones who are celibate? So here's an extremely quick rundown. Just remember, the Shakers have been around for nearly 300 years, and their faith continues to evolve. So no one belief or practice that I mention is going to encapsulate all of that history. The Shakers have their origins in the religious movement now known as the First Great Awakening. In England in the 1740s, a small group of charismatic Christians emerged called the Wardley Society. The Wardley Society was known for its energetic worship services, in which attendees would jump and shake in spiritual ecstasy. Observers called them the Shaking Quakers, which later got shortened to Shakers. Despite the nickname, it's unclear if the Shakers ever had any real connection to the Quakers. Oh, and by the way, the real name of the Shaker faith is the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing, which we'll talk more about in a future episode. The Shakers immigrated to the American colonies in the 1770s and founded faith-based communities across what soon became the United States, including Mount Lebanon, which was founded in 1787. For much of their history, the Shakers have committed to practicing the three C's, celibacy and imitation of the life of Christ, confession of sin as an important part of daily life, and a community of goods through shared ownership of resources. The Shaker faith is ongoing. There's one active community left, the Sabbath Day Lake Shaker Village in Maine, home to two remaining Shakers, Brother Arnold Had and Sister June Carpenter. And yes, the Shakers do have a history of creating beautiful, minimalist furniture. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video. If you are, hit like and subscribe below. That will help new folks find my videos in the future. Thanks. All right, back to Cecilia. In 1862, when she sang supplication in her sleep, Cecilia would have been living a life of relative comfort at Mount Lebanon. It was a community of 600 people on a large property dotted with granaries, mills, and factories, and it was far away from the battles happening further south. But even so, Cecilia was shocked by the war's carnage. Let's examine the first verse of supplication. Dark is the cloud that rests over the nation. Wild is the war cry that pierces the air. God's heavy judgments spread wide desolation. Strong hearts are bound in the depths of despair. Like many of her fellow Americans, Cecilia was struggling to comprehend a baffling amount of bloodshed. We know that between 620,000 and 850,000 soldiers died in the course of the war. Roughly one in four soldiers who left home never came back again. In most places in this country, there was no way you could live through the war and not know people who had died or disappeared. Life on the home front was brutal as well. In cities and in the countryside, people died of diseases spread from army camps, in attacks by occupying forces, and from starvation due to theft or lack of hands to tend the crops. Racial violence against free and unfree African Americans was also rampant. The total number of non-combatants who died during the war remains a mystery. No one had experienced death on this scale before, and neither the North nor the South had the resources to deal with it. Unburied corpses were strewn across battlefields for years. Makeshift hospitals spilled out into fields and pastures, and prison camps were bursting with far more diseased and starving soldiers than could be cared for. Even Cecilia, living peacefully on the periphery of the war, would have read newspapers filled with lists of the dead and missing. And this unfathomable bloodshed was likely on her mind when she sang, strong hearts are bound in the depths of despair. Right now, all of us are grappling with death on the same scale. We're constantly hearing numbers of how many people died of COVID today, how many have died so far, how many might die before this is all over. For those of us who aren't on the front lines or who live in communities that are privileged enough to largely avoid death from the virus, these numbers can feel very abstract. Author William Fox, who documented a comprehensive list of Union and Confederate casualties, wrote, 
It is easy to imagine one man killed, or ten men killed, or perhaps a score of men killed, but even the veteran is unable to comprehend the dire meaning of the 100,000. The figures are too large. In the second verse of supplication, Cecilia sang, Lord, may the bands of the captive be broken. Oh, may this struggle bring true liberty. Teach man that love is a heaven-born token, and that the truth can alone make us free. Here Cecilia names the cause of the war, slavery. She prays to God that the war might bring liberation to the captives of the nation, and that all people might learn the importance of love and compassion. Today we take for granted that slavery is an evil institution. At least, most of us do. But religious communities at the time of the Civil War were sharply divided on this issue. Now, the Shakers were emancipationists. They believed that slavery was wrong, but unlike abolitionists, they usually didn't go about actively liberating enslaved people. They also believed in racial equality, and several Shaker villages, including ones in Kentucky, were integrated long before the Civil War broke out. But the Shakers were also pacifists, so enlisting in the Union Army, even if your purpose was to fight against slavery, could get you expelled from the community. Cecilia's writing leaves little doubt about her views on slavery. Aside from supplication, Cecilia wrote several poems with titles including The Last Day of Slavery and The Underground Railroad. Cecilia's conscious views no doubt shaped supplication in a nation's calamity, but there's also something to the Shaker idea that this was a gift song, a song given from heavenly or otherwise unseen forces. This wasn't the only time that powerful words and visions emerged from Cecilia's sleep. Cecilia also had a prophetic dream about the death of Abraham Lincoln and the execution of the Lincoln conspirators. In April of 1865, she dreamed she was in a splendid theater. She then recalled, a man seemed to walk on the air out of one of the boxes. A flag flew after him, but he trampled on the end of it and disappeared. In a moment, there was a wild commotion such that the whole assembly swayed like people in anguish. I shared the intensity, but knew not the meaning. When I looked at the stage, four ropes were hanging from the ceiling, and distinctly through the tumult that prevailed was whispered, for the great crime they are to be executed before the people when the hour strikes. Eleven days later, news of Lincoln's assassination reached Mount Lebanon. Our last verse reads, Guide Zion's children in this trying hour. Keep us dependent on thy love and care. Down in the valley we find thy true power. Lord, in thy mercy, O guard us still there. In this final verse, Cecilia directly addresses God, asking him to bless and protect the Shakers. But the line that really catches me in this verse is the third one, down in the valley we find thy true power. In Shaker song traditions, being in a valley can be a metaphor for a state of humility where one can be closer to God. So why? After lamenting the carnage of war and the abomination of slavery, does Cecilia end her song with a call for humility? I look around today and I think I can understand why. I see one half of our nation genuinely believing that the other half is full of fools and extremists and vice versa. We are all living through an experience of mass death and suffering, and yet we continue to refuse to recognize the humanity in one another. That's what happens when pride overtakes humility, when we convince ourselves that we are absolutely right and so others must be wrong, when we understand ourselves as fundamentally worth more than our neighbors. As long as these realities continue to dominate our national life, Cecilia Song suggests, we will remain a nation prone to calamity. Our wealth is built upon hundreds of years of exploited labor, and reckoning with that legacy is no easier now than it was 150 years ago. Cecilia's song offers not only a stark depiction of the historic grief that still shapes our daily interactions, but also a prayer for the safety of our nation, just as relevant today as it ever was. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, another reminder to hit like and subscribe below. 
Also, check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash Lynch.